on this very beautiful Montgomery County Day uh, to welcome my colleague and friend, Congressman Mike Thompson, who is here with us to talk about the very important issue of gun violence in this country, and you'll learn from him and about him his leadership on this issue. Uh, before I get started, I'll just introduce myself. I'm Madeline Dean. I'm the Congresswoman for Pennsylvania's 4th Congressional District, 97% of Montgomery County and a piece of Berks County. I am honored to be in that position, sworn in just in January, and we've been busy at work. Before we talk about the specific issue of gun violence, let me just acknowledge some of the leaders, advocates, uh, and others who are here. I apologize. I know I'll miss somebody, but we'll, we'll fill in as I can. We're, we are joined by Senator Maria Collette, Senator Muth, Representative McCarter, although I think he's not here, but Mrs. McCarter is here in his stead. Representative Sanchez, Representative Daly. These are all my former colleagues in the Pennsylvania House and Senate. Representative Webster, we're joined by Montgomery County Sheriff Sean Kilkenny, uh, who's a former federal prosecutor and supports us in our efforts with the background checks. A recorder of deeds, Jeannie Sorg, Terea Hudson, Shay Ash, uh, and Val Cooper, all area leaders here, either in the school board or on our town council. And I'm delighted to be joined by some young people, uh, Victoria and Adriana, where are you, uh, from Norristown Area High School. They are elected leaders in their high school, where we just came from. We're here to talk about a difficult subject, the American gun violence epidemic. And the people you will hear from today, survivors, veterans, activists, and government leaders from local, state, and uh, county and federal levels will each speak to a different facet of this complicated issue. What unites us all, though, is simple. Background checks save lives. First, a few facts. In 2017, these were the shocking numbers. The Centers for Disease Control and Prevention reported that nearly 40,000 people died in this country in a single year, more than half to suicide and nearly 134,000 others were wounded, literally caught in the crossfire. That means that every day, today, yesterday, tomorrow, 109 Americans on average are shot and killed. That means one person every 13 minutes. In the hour we have scheduled for this press conference and questions, four or five more of our fellow citizens will be gone, another 15 will be wounded. And I'm very mindful of the terrible overnight news of New Zealand and the tragic slaughter there. So we've got to be honest with ourselves. America, the world, but America in particular, has an enormous, awful gun violence problem. And it's time we got our hearts and our heads and our legislation around that fact. But we also do need to do something about it on a human level. Last month, as we were introducing H.R. 8, the background check bill that we will talk about, I met a young woman from Chicago. She described growing up with her friends and so many were either wounded or killed uh, by gun violence. She doubted whether her best friend would make it to his 18th birthday. And she said, on his 18th birthday, he was shot and killed. Another life extinguished in America. The week before that, I attended a gun safety a rally at a synagogue in Elkins Park. The event was organized powerfully by young people. The guest speaker was Samara Barrick, a survivor of last year's massacre at the Parkland uh, Marjorie Stoneman Douglas High School that claimed the lives of 17 people. Samara went through something that no one should ever have to experience, and certainly no person in a school should experience. She pleaded over and over again. She said, I just want my life back. I just want my friends back. I just want to think about going to class and enjoying the weekends and thinking about where I'm going to go to college. That same conviction motivates me to get involved in gun violence prevention. I literally took my kids to the Million Mom March back in 2000. And as a state representative after Sandy Hook, I and many of the people that you see here formed the PA Safe Caucus, to say if the federal government won't do something about it, at least at the state level, we will do something about it. I realized after Parkland, with a heartbreaking bolt of electricity, that my then first grade granddaughter, a six-year-old, had to go through active shooter drills. What is wrong in this country that we ask more of our children than we do of gun manufacturers? Something's very wrong, but some things are changing, and that's what we're here to talk about. We just passed, two weeks ago, we just passed a bill written by my colleague and friend, 
Uh, Mike Thompson, HR 8. It says something very simple. If you want to buy a gun in America, you have to pass a background check. That sounds obvious. I agree it is. And 96% of Americans agree. 83% of gun owners recognize the need for and the validity of background checks. We also passed a second bill the very next day, uh, and that would show, close the Charleston loophole. If you remember in that shooting, Dylan Roof applied for a gun, did not pass the background check, and under federal law, if in three days they cannot get clarity, the licensed firearm dealer has the ability, the right to sell that gun. Dylan Roof bought the gun on day three. On day five, he was denied. They got clarity. He was a prohibited purchaser. Too late, he had his hands on the gun. We passed the Charleston loophole bill in the House the very next day. So for a very long time, for decades in fact, Congress has refused to act on gun violence. But this year, thanks to a wave of new members in Congress and some powerful organizing of students and activists like the ones you see here and the powerful leader, leadership of Mike Thompson, who is chair of the Gun Violence Prevention Task Force, we are changing hearts and minds and legislation. So without further ado, I want to introduce my friend, uh, somebody that I look up to for his leadership in our Congress. He's here with us today. He literally could have gone home to Napa and relax with your family a little earlier this weekend, but he said, no, I will travel with you by train yesterday. Have dinner with me last night. We just spoke to uh, about 600 students at Norristown Area High School who are engaged and care deeply about this issue. He is the chairman of the Gun Violence Prevention Task Force. It is his bill, H.R. 8, uh, that we passed. I thank you for traveling. Let's give a very big Montgomery County welcome to Congressman Mike Thompson. Thank you. Madeline, thank you very, very much for that nice introduction. I think I want to bring you to California and have you talk that way about me in my district. <laughs> what an honor it is to be here. And what an honor it is for me to serve with this incredibly wonderful member of Congress that you sent to Washington, D.C. She is fantastic. And, you know, when I knew she was going to win, and I, I looked at the work she had done uh, as a member of the state legislature here, I was enthused. I knew that she would bring a, a whole new effort and a whole new enthusiasm to Washington on this issue of gun violence prevention, and boy, was I right. For 26 years, no major gun violence prevention legislation passed out of the House Committee on the Judiciary. She's there a couple of months, passed. Yeah, passed. it must have been me. <laughs> and, and she talked about the wave of new members who brought this new commitment to Washington. She's at the tip of the spear in that new class. And what a pleasure it was to watch her, with her expertise on this issue, uh, speak on this matter in that committee. You were instrumental. You did a fantastic job, and I'm really glad you're there. Uh, I can tell you that my friends in Washington are glad you sent her there. Make sure she keeps coming back because uh, she's going to be able to do some really good things that are important to all of us. The bill that we're talking about is background checks. Over 90% of the American people support it. Gun owners support it. NRA members support it. I'm a gun owner. I believe strongly in the Second Amendment. And I believe even stronger in the fact that we need to ensure that we keep guns out of the hands of people who shouldn't have them. And how can you do that if you don't do a background check? It's pretty simple. If you're a criminal, if you're dangerously mentally ill, you don't get a gun. And how can you prevent that from happening if you don't first do a background check? Sadly, all states don't have the same laws under which uh, they operate. The federal law says that if you buy a gun from a federally licensed gun dealer, you have to pass a background check. Some states, Pennsylvania one, California one, have even stricter laws, uh, and appropriately so. But many states, their only law is the federal minimum. So someone can walk into a licensed dealer, try and buy a gun, be turned down because they're prohibited, walk out of the door, go to a gun show, or go online and buy the same gun with no background check. That's wrong, 
You know it. The American people know it. The Judiciary Committee certainly knew it. They passed the bill. And the House of Representatives knew it because we passed the bill there, too. It works. It saves lives. Every day, 70 felons are stopped from buying a gun at a licensed dealer because of the background check. Every day, 50 domestic abusers are stopped from buying a gun at a federally licensed dealer because of the background check. Why in the world would you allow them to turn around, walk out the door, go to a gun show, or go online and buy the same gun? It doesn't make sense. This bill is appropriate. This bill is constitutional. It doesn't infringe on anybody's rights, and it's not going to be the gateway to taking everybody's guns away. It's going to make sure that people who shouldn't have guns don't get guns. It's one step closer to keeping our communities safe. So students don't have to do active shooter drills. So first responders, cops and firefighters don't have to worry about getting shot. I'm the father of a first responder, of the father of two first responders, a firefighter and a police officer. And when my deputy sheriff's son goes out, I want to make sure that uh, he's as safe as he can be. It's already a dangerous job. We don't need people who are criminals running around with, uh, with guns, terrorizing our communities, our school, or our, our, our public service members. So thank you all for being here. Uh, thank you for all that you're doing. And we need to see this bill passed by the Senate and signed into law. Thank you. Thank you, Mike. Again, thank you for coming here. Thank you for your leadership on this bill. Uh, next is Julia Spohr, a friend of mine. Uh, she inspires me. She's a gun safety activist. Julia. Here she is. My name is Julia Spohr. I'm 17, and I live in Jenkintown, Pennsylvania. Activism has been important to me ever since I since before I knew what it was. In elementary school, my local news channel visited my front yard in Seminole Heights in Tampa, Florida, uh, as I held a lemonade stand and that sent 100% of profits to tsunami relief overseas. When my father committed gun suicide 10 days before my eighth birthday, I changed forever. The thought that kept going through my head was, I don't want anyone else to feel this way. I don't want any other children to lose their parents this way. And so that's what I'm fighting for. Some fellow youth activists and I co-founded Students Demand Action for Gun Sense in America a little over a year ago. Within weeks, we had tens of thousands of members and groups popping up all over the country. Today, we have over 70,000 members nationwide and over 200 groups in high schools and colleges across the country. Students Demand Action is fighting for gun safety laws. is fighting for gun safety laws across this country and outside of the country. We are students united together to defeat gun violence. We are students united to defeating gun violence. generation is overlooked and incredibly important. I'm not old enough to vote yet, but I will be very soon, and I do intend on running for office someday. Yes. My voice <laughs> my voice, and the voices of those in my generation are incredibly important, and we will be changing things. Thank you. Thank you, Julia. Now we're he we'll hear from Julia's mom, another friend and an important activist, Jennifer Luger. 
Uh, she joined Moms Demand Action in 2015 and has been working in our community uh, and inspiring a lot of people like me. Jennifer. Good morning, my name is Jennifer Luger. I am from Jenkintown, Pennsylvania, where I serve on the Borough Council. But today, I'm here as a gun violence survivor and Julie's mother. The first time my husband attempted suicide in January 2009, he was hospitalized for a few days until the crisis passed and we were sent home with a worksheet that said, get help and oh, if there's a gun in the house, hide it. Um, this came totally out of the blue. I was not prepared. I had no idea what to do. And I drove to Office Depot with my heart racing and my hands shaking to buy a little lockbox because my husband did own a handgun and I wanted to lock it away. Had there been any kind of support by law enforcement, if there was a way to judicially get that thing out of the house, I would have left on it. A couple of months later, he was doing well. We were going to our family's um, home in the mountains of North Carolina where he liked to practice target shooting. He begged me to get his gun back. He just wanted to feel normal. He was doing great. He wanted to shoot at milk jugs. It was fun. So I gave in. A um, few months after that, he used that handgun to end his life. On September 25th, 2010, he drove away from our home and I was able to alert law enforcement so surrounded by police he ended his life in his car and that day I had to go home and tell my daughter who was seven years old that her father was gone since then I have worked to put my family back together and to make sure that doesn't happen to anyone else and right now I think we're at a tipping point Thanks to Representative Thompson and Dean, we have HR 8, which would assure universal background checks. Thanks to our wonderful state legislators, I see a bunch of them here, Senator Collette, Senator Muth, Representative-elect Johnson Harrell. <laughs> this year we're going to pass an extreme risk, risk protection order in Pennsylvania following in the steps of 13 other states that already have the legislation. We estimate that it would save 100 Pennsylvanians' lives from suicide each year. And that may not sound like a lot, but we know that 20 people are traumatized from every suicide, so it would make a real difference. We are at a tipping point. This isn't a simple problem, and it doesn't have a simple solution. But thanks to bit by bit, by law by law, we are making a difference, and we are going to change this. Thank you. And next, I'm pleased to introduce uh, the chair of the Montgomery County Board of Commissioners, Dr. Valerie Arkush. Good morning. It's a pleasure to be here with all of you today. I want to welcome Representative Thompson and thank Representative Dean for her incredible leadership as our new representative to Congress. I stand here with you today wearing two hats. Uh, first, that as chair of our Montgomery County Board of Commissioners and elected official, but also as a physician, an anesthesiologist who worked in level one trauma centers around our region and know firsthand that we are in the midst of a public health crisis. H.R. 8, the Background Checks Act of 2019, is the most sweeping federal gun control measure to make it out of the House in decades. It will require background checks for all firearm sales in the country, even private exchanges. Closing that loophole would shut down an invisible market in which weapons change hands freely between friends and strangers with little oversight. Last year alone, 46, 46 of our friends and neighbors in Montgomery County were victims of firearm deaths. And 32 of those deaths, 32 of 46, or 70 percent, were death by suicide. I think that we can all agree that we need to work harder to ensure that those considering suicide should not have easy access to a firearm because firearms are the most common way that our Montgomery County friends and relatives die by suicide. And our data shows that if a firearm is not readily available, these individuals do not find another way. 
So this is a critical public health measure. Just as importantly, each of our children has the right to feel safe in their own schools. Parents should not have to worry when they drop their child off at the bus in the morning if they're going to see that child come home at the end of the day. And nor should any person have to worry that their place of worship is anything more than a safe and welcoming place for prayer and reflection. This morning I called the Imam of our local North Penn Mosque to express my deep console condolences and support for the incredible tragic loss of life in New Zealand yesterday in other mosques on the other side of the world. Gun violence is indisputably an issue of health where science and evidence must guide the cure. We need to emphasize violence prevention and conflict resolution training for our community of officials and professionals. And I personally call on the U.S. Senate to take up H.R. 8 and pass H.R. 8. There is no vote scheduled as far as I know, but there should be. And every one of us must reach out to our senators to make sure that this bill has a chance to be voted on in our U.S. Senate. And let's see where our senators stand. I, for one, fully support this bill and will do everything I can to see its passage. Thank you. And alongside uh, uh, Dr. Arkush as our chair, Commissioner Ken Lawrence, uh, her governing partner, uh, is here to lend his voice uh, to the background check bill. Congressman Thompson, welcome. Uh, thank you for your leadership on this issue. Mad, you've been working on this for years in the State House and have actually taught me a lot about it as well. And it's wonderful to see you go to DC and start making things happen. I'm really here as a father, uh, a father of two boys who have had active shooter drills at their high school. And after Parkland, my son asked me what I was going to do. And I said, well, it's, it's not a county issue. Uh, it's a state issue, it's a, it's a federal issue. And he said, well, isn't that just a cop-out, Dad? And it was a cop-out. So I want to recognize the students who are here because for all the leadership of our elected leaders, I really think it's the students who have driven this issue um, and inspired the nation and made us wake up that we need to do something. So can we give a hand for our students? <laughs> Just this week here in Montgomery County, there was a case prosecuted by our district attorney, Kevin Steele, where there was a man in the parking lot at a gun show selling guns illegally. And they sent undercover agents up to, to negotiate the purchase of the guns. And the agent said, I can't pass a background check. So the person just raised the price of the guns. So if you can't pass, well, well you, you have to pay $50 more. And then when the agents approached him to arrest him, he actually drew a gun on those agents and cocked it. So background checks are, yes, seem so simple and so fundamental, but there's other work to be done. Um, and I'm proud that we have a House of Representatives that is doing that work. I'm proud that we have new representatives in the State House and the State Senate who will do this work. And we will do everything we can here at the county level to support you and to support our students and to save lives. Thank you. And next, a tireless advocate for gun sense in Pennsylvania, Ceasefire's, uh, Ceasefire PA's Executive Director, Shira Goodman. Thank you, Congresswoman Dean. I'm so honored to be here. I worked with you when you were my state representative and now my congresswoman. And Congressman Thompson, thank you for coming uh, to our county and for your tireless leadership. I just want to make a couple remarks. I woke up today to the news in New Zealand and I was furious. And I know I don't lobby in New Zealand. I, I'm not in charge of that. But every time we make a step forward, it seems we go backwards. And people in mosques and synagogues and churches and schools and bars and concerts and parking lots, walking home, wherever they live, are always in the right place at the right time. They're not in the wrong place at the wrong time. We have a right to live our lives free of fear 
and free of, you know, to, to, to be safe. And we somehow have neglected that or sacrificed it or compromised it. And we have to say no. So on a day like today, I'm so glad to be with friends and fellow fighters in this fight. And I wanted to give you a little bit of a word of Torah from the Old Testament. I'm a little nervous because Rabbi Cernovitz and Rabbi Riegler are here, but they said it'd be okay. So if you, I, I wanted to get you something good, but I actually thought back to something I learned when I was pretty young in Hebrew school. Hashomer achi anochi. This is what Cain says to God when he says, where is your brother Abel? Cain says, Hashomer achi anochi. Am I my brother's keeper? And what does God say back? The blood of your brother is crying to me from the ground. We are all our brother's keepers. What happened in New Zealand, what happened in Parkland, what happens every day in Norristown, in Philadelphia, is our problem. These are our brothers and sisters, and we need to take action. And so I am thrilled that HRA passed. We had, I think, 10 of our delegation voted for it, all of our Democrats and one Republican, and we have two senators. And I agree with Commissioner Arkush, you need to talk to them, but you really only need to talk to one because I know where Senator Casey is. He has pledged he will vote for it and will work to get it to the floor. So you need to talk to Senator Toomey, who has championed background checks in the past. We need him to do that now. If he is a champion for background checks, this is the bill, the companion bill, SR 42. And I just want to add one thing. Uh, Chairman Thompson was very generous when he said that Pennsylvania and California have laws that are stronger. That is true. But Pennsylvania is nowhere near the category of California, sir. We still have a loophole that allows people to buy long guns without a background check in a private sale. The guns used in all of these shootings, including the one today. So if there are any, any of my legislator friends out there, don't feel complacent. I know Movita will not let you either, but Pennsylvania has a long way to go until we're California. So I hope that you'll stand with me and fight, because when we are asked where were we and what did we do, we need to be, have a better answer for these kids because they are coming for your jobs and my job and as I view myself just as a placeholder for them. Thank you. It gives me particular pleasure and honor to introduce newly elected State Representative Movita Johnson Carroll. Just won her special election this week. Pennsylvania House just got one person mighty stronger. Thank you. I want to say good morning, everyone, but it does not feel like a good morning as I woke to the news of New Zealand and 49 lives lost due to gun violence. I want to thank Congressman Thompson and Congresswoman Dean for bringing us together today for HR8. It's very, very important that we ensure that this bill passes, this legislation passes. It's crucial to the Commonwealth. I want to thank Julia for her courage to continue to stand and speak about her loss. I can relate to that loss. On Easter Sunday, March 30th, 1975, my father was murdered in front of my family. Something that no child should have to live with is the loss of a parent due to gun violence. And many, many years later, as I worked to protect my children, I was always very hyper vigilant about violence. I fought for my children. On January 15, 2008, I left Philadelphia to protect my children from the gun violence. On January 13, 2008, my 18-year-old son, Charles Andre Johnson, was murdered in a case of mistaken identity. I agree with Shara. There is no such thing as wrong place, wrong time. My son had a right to go pick his sister up to make sure that she was safe. My son had a right to life. This is not a Second Amendment fight. I am licensed to carry. But this is a constitutional fight because all of our children have a right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Everyone that lives in Pennsylvania has a right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, and the Second Amendment and the greedy gun lobby does not supersede that right. So as we stand today, and as we mourn for New Zealand, 
And as our legislature becomes stronger and stronger in the fight against gun violence, we ask you sooner, Senator Toomey, join this side of the line. There is a line drawn, and the line is between life and death. There is no middle ground anymore. You have to choose a side, and the side that you choose should be for the citizens of Pennsylvania. Representative. Uh, now I'd like to call forward Dave Corrigan. He works with me in my office for veteran services. He's a field representative with an, a unique perspective as a veteran himself. Good morning. I'm Dave Cor Corrigan and I'm currently the veterans and military representative for Congresswoman Dean. I'm honored to be here today to speak on a subject that is near and dear to my heart. So thank you, Representative Dean, Representative Thompson, for allowing me to share. I would like to discuss a part of H.R. 8, Amendment 45, which is Congresswoman Dean's amendment, which clarifies that the exemption to the background check would apply to persons who are at risk of committing suicide. And as you know, the rate of suicide among military members and veterans is real and it is devastating. I served five years in the Marine Corps, and during that time, I served with a multitude of Marines and sailors who have committed suicide, attempted suicide, or had suicidal ideations. Military service members and veterans are among the largest groups that hunt, collect firearms, and target shoot. But even some of the most well-trained gun owners in America sometimes find themselves at a period of crisis where they're deciding whether to turn the weapons on themselves to end their pain. The good news is the stigmas about coming for help are dissipating. And if a veteran or a military member, or anyone for that matter, wants to transfer their weapons to somebody else for their own safety, we owe it to them to honor that request without having to break the law in the process. The last unit I was attached to in Representative Thompson's home state of California was in charge of caring for wounded, ill, and injured Marines and preparing them to return to service or return to post-service life. Fortunately, the prevalence of combat wounds has decreased significantly in the past couple of years. But invisible wounds have taken the front seat of the patients there. While I was there, we had a number of Marines either attempt suicide or have suicidal ideations who own firearms in their homes. And as the, the suicide prevention program officer, I was in charge of having the written procedures on what to do if something like this occurs. Um, and it happened a number of times. But caring for someone in crisis is a lot more personal than that. We never hesitated to take the weapons from somebody who wanted to, to protect their own safety. But looking back, that could have been a crime in some places. And we were never punished, but we owe it to everyone to extend that courtesy in written legislation to everyone who is helping a friend in crisis. And that is what Congresswoman Dean's amendment, Amendment 45, does. We often speak of common sense gun legislation, but we don't always agree on what that looks like. But we may have found it. Understanding when somebody is in crisis and being able to take their firearms for them for their own safety without a background check is not only necessary, but it's what common sense looks like. Thank you. That amendment may seem simple, and I thank Dave for telling the, the powerful importance of it. And I really want to thank uh, Chairman Thompson for allowing me to offer that amendment, for working with me on that very small amendment, which I think will make a very big difference. I offer it in honor of Julia and Jennifer, of, of your dad and husband, and very importantly, Marge and Tom, in honor of Ron, your beloved son, Ron. Uh, so I was delighted to be able to work with you uh, to uh, introduce that, to include it in the bill. It will save lives. Uh, and now I wanted to ask my dear friend, Rabbi Larry Cernovitz, uh, to close this out, and then we will welcome your questions. And we're joined by your children. Yes. Your children have been so good. They're always good. <laughs> it's an honor to be here today. And I want to stand and say to the new state representative, we stand with you, not just as the Jewish community, but as humanity. Because today, this crisis that we are talking about, this is a state of moral emergency in this country and in this world. Make no bones about it. It's a moral emergency because people have the will to do something about this.
and choose not to. They're so influenced by other parties and by lobbyists and by donors that they refuse to take the tough stance that they need to. And this morning, as many others have said, I called all of our local imams and mosques, and I said that we stand with you because it wasn't so long ago that we stood mourning 11 who were killed in a Pittsburgh synagogue. And it wasn't about the Jewish community then, as it's not about the Muslim community now. It's about humanity and that we must be able to look in the eyes of another human being and say, when I look at you, I see the eyes of humanity, of a shared fate. And the only way we will solve this, with the resolve of people to step forward and to do the right thing, like Congressman Thompson and, thank God, Congresswoman Dean, who represents us so beautifully in Washington and has already made such a huge difference. And as we stand here today, this is this moment. But the important moment stands of what we do after this press conference is over today. And several years ago, when Senator Toomey launched the Toomey Mansion Bill, for those of you who are paying attention, I ran into him in Congress after that failed. And I said, Senator Toomey, will you reintroduce this into Congress again? And his reply I will never forget. He said, I won't, because the voices of the opposition are stronger than the voices of those in support. Think about that today. And think about that when you leave here today, whether you pick up that phone and you flood his office with phone calls, because they must take your phone call. Let them know that the voices of the people of the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania will make note of what you do to protect our children and to protect this country against what is nothing less than a national emergency in our country, a real national emergency. So with my children, two of my three children who are standing here today, who have active shooter drills in their schools, and my son was late coming home the other day because someone walked into his school that shouldn't have been there and they shut down, remember that? They shut down the entire school until they could make sure everything was safe. No more in America. This is the land of the free and the home of the brave. Let's be brave. Let's do this and may God give us the courage and strength to do what's right now because as our children and our grandchildren will ask us one day, where were we? As Ken said earlier, where were we when we had the opportunity to do something and we stood by idly while our neighbor bleeds? Let's stand up today and let's make a difference today. Thank you. Uh, I want to thank everyone for being here, for your incredible participation. You are local leaders, you are elected leaders, you are activists, uh, so many people with us. I thank the media for covering this. This matters. It is a question of our common humanity. As John Den Dunn wrote many, many, many years ago, no man is an island entire of himself. Every man's death diminishes me. So this is not somebody else's problem. This is every one of our problems. And Mike, I want to see if you want to say anything before we'll take some questions. Well, again, thank you for all that you're doing. And what an incredible group you brought together. I, I, was, I can't tell you how impressed I was. So thank you all very much. Thank you. Do you have any questions?